Good evening and uh, hello to everyone and welcome to this uh, first webinar that is organized by the International Headache Society. My name is uh, Henrik Schütz. I'm a neurologist from Copenhagen and I'm co-chair of the International Headache Society Committee. In the Education Committee, we have planned for some time to produce online uh, learning material. And this webinar is also one of the initiatives that we have uh, started. Uh, we have also pr produced some videos and podcasts and uh, they will launch together with the redesign of the International Headache Society website. And I can actually reveal to you that uh, the new ITS website just launched about six hours ago. So uh, you can go into the ITS uh, website after the webinar and see some of the new features that we have. Um, so for this uh, webinar, more than 500 had, has signed up uh, for this uh, webinar. Uh, and uh, so far the attendees are coming into this webinar and uh, we have uh, wanted to make this an, an open webinar for, for everyone. But uh, in the future, the, the webinars will be only for IHS members. Uh, so I recommend that if you are not an IHS member, then you could become an IHS member. Um, and you can go into the uh, ITS website to become a member. And uh, I would uh, also like to get your input and suggestions into other educational uh, activities that the International Headache Society can uh, arrange. So you can write to me uh, at this uh, learning center email um, to, to give me uh, feedback. And um, I'll show you some of the advantages of uh, becoming a ISS members, there are different uh, benefits. Uh, it allows you to be a subscriber to Cephalalgia online. Uh, and uh, you're also allowed to get online to the neuroscientist. And of course, you can uh, go to the web uh, ITS website uh, learning center and uh, get access to guidelines and uh, a lot of other uh, advantages. So I would really encourage you to become an ITS uh, member. This uh, webinar will be about cluster headache and we'll be hearing from two great uh, lecturers on both uh, clinical and scientific aspects of uh, cluster headache. Uh, after the lectures, there'll be a Q&A session. So as we go along, you can write questions uh, via the Q&A option uh, below. Uh, I'd like to ask three things of you. Uh, I'd like you to state your name and where you're from. And it will also be great if you could uh, state who you'd like to ask, uh, or maybe if you want to ask uh, both of the lecturers. And uh, then uh, after each lecture, uh, or after both lectures are done, I'll address the questions to our lecturers and we'll have a discussion. Uh, this session is also streamed uh, live on the ITS Facebook site, and it will be recorded and later shown on the ITS uh, website. And, um, I would like to thank so much to the lecturers for participating in this. And um, to begin with, I'd like to present uh, the first speaker, Dr. Manjit Mathau. Uh, Dr. Mathau is an associate professor at the UCL, uh, Queen Square Institution of Neurology, and he's an honorary consultant neurologist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery uh, in London. And uh, Dr. Mathau is a well-known expert in headache and especially in the, in the tax. And I know that he's also an excellent uh, speaker and teacher. And I look very much forward to this lecture on symptoms and treatment of uh, cluster headache. So now I'll hand over uh, to uh, Dr. Mathau so he can present his presentation. Thank you, Henrik, for a very generous introduction. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, first uh, webinar run by the IHS. Let me start off by congratulating the Education Committee and Henrik in particular for having put a massive effort into setting up these educational webinars. I think they're a fantastic idea. I'm honored to be the first one doing a webinar, and I'm looking forward to the other webinars in the future. I think this is an excellent opportunity for all of us to be educated. I would enjoin all of you to uh, visit the website that Hendricks just told us about. It's an absolutely fantastic website, and I'm looking to 
the website being a really good way of interacting with the rest of the Hadi community. Now, without further ado, let us now move on to the topic that I've been asked to talk about. Um, yeah, so let me bring my slides up. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I've been asked to talk about the symptoms and treatment of cluster headaches. Here's my disclosure statement. Yeah, so what is cluster headache? Cluster headache is one of the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias, one of the tags. And the tags are defined by being strictly unilateral, predominantly in the first division of the trigeminal division. The pain tends to be excruciating. These are considered to be some of the most painful conditions known to mankind. And the defining features besides the unilaterality and the excruciating pain is that they're associated with cranial autonomic features. These cranial autonomic features tend to be a combination of parasympathetic hyperactivity and sympathetic deficit. We have four conditions that are grouped under the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias. First, a headache is the prototype and is, far, is by far the commonest. All the others are relatively rare, but nonetheless quite important to appreciate. The others are paroxysmal hemicrania, the short-lasting unilateral neuralgiform headache attacks, which are further subdivided into sunken sooner and hemicrania continuum. Fortunately for us, uh, we can often differentiate them because they differ in their attack frequency and duration. However, there does tend to be an overlap, so appreciating these conditions uh, and knowing what the limits are of their, uh, of their presentation can be very helpful. And part of the importance of actually appreciating these conditions is that they're highly disabling. As I just said, they, they cause excruciating pain. And jumping in with the right treatments for the right patient is absolutely critical. Yeah. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to mainly talk about cluster headaches, but my slides will have some information about the other tags, which are really there for your benefit in case you do want to go back and look at them. So what is cluster headache? The ICHD criteria, the International Classification of Headache the, the Disorders criteria, captures the phenotype really well. Yeah? All the important features of this syndrome are essentially summarized very well in, uh, in the ICHD criteria. The uh, cluster headaches tend to be strictly unilateral, though they can be side variable. The pain is severe and is predominantly situated around the orbit, the supraorbital region, the forehead, and the temple. The attacks tend to last anywhere from 15 minutes to up to three hours, and the attack frequency is anywhere from one every other day to as many as eight daily. The signature feature, as I said earlier on, is to have at least one cranial autonomic feature. And these cranial autonomic features are the eye going red, watering, swelling up, drooping, uh, the pupil becoming small, meiosis, uh, the nose becoming blocked or runny, facial redness or facial sweating. And if you don't have one of these, then a sense of restlessness or agitation will suffice. But let's put some more meat on the bones, as it were, to give more of an idea of what the phenotype really is. Yeah? So besides the attack frequency and duration that I've just talked about, the pain tends to be not only very severe, but often has a very sharp and throbbing quality. One of the signature features of cluster headache tends to be this circadian and circannual periodicity. By circadian periodicity, I mean that the patients often report that the attacks are occurring at about the same time every day, and 70% of the patients will demonstrate that. These patients often demonstrate what's called a circannual periodicity. For those patients who have episodic cluster headaches, they will often say that the attacks are occurring at about the same time every year, and often for about the same duration uh, of time that uh, they, they have these attacks. Autonomic features are obligate by definition, but what is often not appreciated is that migraine symptoms such as photophobia, phonophobia, osmophobia uh, are also very common, as are nausea and vomiting. So there's an overlap with migraine. And it's one of the things that I often say to my trainees that, you know, take a full history capturing all the features, but stand back, look at the big, uh, big picture and see what are the prominent aspects of the phenotype because that will often give you the clue as to what's going on. Now, restlessness can be a very, very useful feature. In migraine, 90% of the patients have motion sensitivity and they want to lie down. In cluster headache, the figure is the other way around. 90% are restless, they can't sit still. And it can be a very distinguishing feature when it comes to determining whether somebody has got migraine or cluster headache. The other thing to appreciate is aura 
is something that goes also with cluster headache. While aura tends to be very common in migraine, up to 14% of people with cluster headache will get a typical migraineous aura. And aura has been, described, has been described with pretty much every other trigeminal of chromicephalalgia. So don't be misled into believing that aura equates to having migraine. In terms of triggers, alcohol tends to be a prominent trigger in about 70% of the patients. The vast majority will say that it triggers an attack within half an hour or so. Other prominent triggers that one needs to be aware of are smell of chemical substances, a warm environment, or exercising can, can, all, uh, can all bring on an attack. Fortunately, the vast majority of patients are episodic, by which I mean they'll often have bouts for a fixed period of time, usually uh, from a few weeks to a few months, and then they're pain-free for the rest of the time. However, 10 to 20% of the patients have the chronic variant where they have daily attacks without any significant remission periods. And what is the epidemiology of this disorder? Occurs in approximately one in a thousand with some of the studies showing that it could occur in as many as one in 500. It has a male predominance. The oldest studies said it's uh, in the region of one to seven ratio, female to male. But the newer studies show that in fact, it's probably closer to one to three. The mean age is about 30, but it can occur at pretty much any age range as the figures over here show. And in recent times, one of the most exciting studies we've seen on the phenotype has in fact come from my Danish colleagues. The Danish group looked at 500 prospective attacks and came up with this beautiful diagram that shows you what happens, that you get what are pre-ictal symptoms, that even before someone has a cluster attack, they get a warning. They get things like such as mood changes, decreased energy, difficulty concentrating, photo and phonophobia. Yeah? Prototypes of migraine often occur uh, at that stage. Then the patient has the attack proper, and after the attack is done, then in the post-ictal phase, which can go on for several hours, they still have things such as the restlessness, the difficulty concentrating, neck changes, and decreased energy. So it's very similar in some ways to migraine, which also has very similar phases. What is the pathophysiological basis? Yeah, it seems that hypothalamic dysfunction in all of these disorders is uh, a signature feature as it has been demonstrated in all of these uh, disorders. Uh, and one of the important biochemical signatures is that you get an elevation of CGRP and VIP uh, during the cluster attacks. The CGRP levels tend to normalize after the cluster attack has been treated with oxygen. And Louise, I'm sure, is going to talk to, you, to us about what happens when you give CGRP infusions to patients with cluster headache. And I look forward to an uh, interesting lecture on that. And in fact, this is some of Louise's data shown on this slide. Now let's move on rapidly to what are the treatment options. We can essentially break down the treatment options of all the trigeminal phonicophilatures, but particularly for uh, cluster headache, into the medical treatments and neuromodulatory treatments. For the medical treatments, which is the main bulk of what we tend to do, it tends to be abortive treatments, treatments to stop an attack, preventive treatments, treatments to reduce the frequency of the attacks, a problem with preventive treatments tends to be that they often take a few weeks to work. And for that reason, we also have what are called transitional treatments. These are bridging treatments that work very quickly, but generally not for very long. So often what we do is we put on a transitional treatment and a preventive treatment. The transitional treatment produces a rapid effect initially, but wears off. But in the meantime, the preventive treatment can take over. For neuromodulation, we have both non-invasive and invasive treatment options available. Okay, so this is an overview of the treatments that we have available and the emerging treatments that are coming through. And I'm going to go through this table one by one, starting with the acute treatments and working through the rest of the table as shown over here. The treatments that are shown in bold are all the treatments that have got randomized control data to back them up. All the other treatments are treatments that are used largely on the basis of uh, experience or expert opinion or case series without randomized controlled evidence. So let's start with the acute treatments. This, uh, <clears throat> this diagram summarizes all the available RCTs that we have in the management of uh, acute cluster headache. So our options are high flow oxygen, oxygen used often at seven to 15 liters per minute. And in the RCT that was done in 150 patients, 78% of the patients were able to abort an attack within 15 minutes compared to just 20 in the placebo group. And with sumatriptan injections, that figure was 74% with a placebo response rate of about 
When you look at the triptans given as nasal preparations, then those figures are lower, between 57% and 40%. And this is borne out in clinical practice that what we find is that somatriptan injections and oxygen tend to be the treatments that patients go to first. Uh, there will be a group of patients who prefer not to have injections, and it's certainly reasonable to try the nasal triptans, but bear in mind that these response rates are at 30 minutes, not even 15 minutes. Yeah? The response rates for these treatments, oxygen and sumatriptan, would be a lot higher at 30 minutes. My own clinical experience is that the vast majority of patients want to use sumatriptan injections rather than oxygen. And the main reason is a significant proportion of patients who use oxygen will often get a rebound attack. And long-term studies show that even though there's an 80% response rate, only about 30 to 40% of the patients carry on using oxygen. What about other preventive treatments? The only treatment, orally available treatment, that has got randomized controlled data is verapamil. This study done by Massimo Leone uh, showed that in a, a relatively small group of patients, 15 in each arm of the placebo and the uh, barum group, that 80% of the patients, 12 out of the 50, 15 patients, had had a significant response, at least a 50% reduction in their cluster attacks at week two, when they used verapamil at 360 milligrams daily, while none of the patients who were on uh, placebo responded. So very clear evidence that verapamil is effective, and that is often borne out in clinical practice as, the, uh, as this agent is one of the most effective agents available. How do you use verapamil? So one of the caveats is that you can often use it at a higher dose than is, uh, was tried out in the clinical trials. Our own practice is to start at 240 milligrams daily and then increase the dose in steps of 80 to 120 milligrams every 10 to 14 days, determined by the pharmacokinetics with ECG monitoring. And we go up to as much as 960 milligrams daily. Yeah. Why is the ECG monitoring essential? With the high doses that are used, significant proportions of patients can get uh, cardiac, uh, cardiac problems. So in this audit we did of 108 patients, 36% developed a bradycardia, but the vast majority, the heart rate was between 50 and 60 and wasn't significant. We only had to stop the therapy in four patients. 19% developed an ECG rhythm abnormality, but the vast majority of those actually had just a first degree heart block, which wasn't of much concern, but 7% had second degree or junctional rhythms. And we had to stop for rapamil and 10% of the patients. So 10% is significant enough a number for us to want to do this on a regular basis, especially at the higher doses. So besides the cardiac problems, the other things you need to look out for are constipation, nausea and vomiting, fatigue, and pedal edema. Yeah, but generally, this is a go-to agent for the management of cluster headaches. What are the other options that you have available? Everything else we have is largely on the basis, as I said, of uh, open-label evidence. Uh, the options are lithium, topiramate, gabapentin, melatonin, and valproate. Now, one of the interesting things to note is that when you look at the dose ranges that are used, very often these patients need much higher doses than usual. Yeah. Lithium, my experience is if it's effective, it tends to be effective at the higher end of the, uh, the, serum, uh, the, the therapeutic uh, range. Uh, and the same thing goes for things like topiramate, as much as 800 milligrams, gabapentin 3,600 milligrams, melatonin uh, uh, 15 milligrams per day, and valproate as much as two grams per day is what is needed. Okay. So what else is coming along? Um, for the CGRP monoclonal antibodies, uh, galconazumab has been shown to be effective in episodic cluster headaches. So this study in which 108 patients were recruited and 90 completed the, the study, uh, when you look at the response rates in episodic cluster headache, 91% of the patients had had a response at week three compared to 53% in the placebo group. Uh, and the side effect profile was excellent with 8% getting some very minor side effects. Unfortunately, the EMA has not approved it. They've asked for another trial to be done, which is a pity because uh, just during the first trial it took three years, and I have a sneaky suspicion that uh, the companies may not be willing to do a trial for the time being. Galconazumab, unfortunately, was ineffective in chronic cluster headache, and it turned out that also framanizumab turned out to be ineffective in chronic cluster headache. So it seems that uh, these agents may be effective in episodic rather than chronic cluster headache. What about the transitional treatments? So hot off the press, uh, Mark Oberman has just presented a study at the AAN where they've done this wonderful RCT of prednisolone. 
starting at 100 milligrams once daily for five days and then tapering the dose by 20 milligrams every three days. And what they've shown is that 34% of the patients are uh, rendered pain-free compared to a uh, placebo response rate of 7.4%. And 50% of the patients have at least a 49% uh, of the patients have at least a 50% reduction in the treatment group versus about 15% in the placebo group. So we've all known and we've all used oral uh, corticosteroids, but this now gives us a firm footing for doing so. And the same thing for suboccipital uh, steroid injections. A randomized controlled trial uh, uh, published by Elizabeth LaRue uh, showed that cortibazole used uh, uh, on almost a, a two or three day basis uh, doing three suboccipital injections can lead to a significant reduction in pain. And the graph speaks for itself with the placebo group over there and the treatment group over there. Uh, and our own experience is that up to 40% of the patients who will have suboccipital nerve uh, uh, sub occipital steroid injections will be rendered pain-free uh, with another 20, 25% getting a significant improvement. So it's a very useful trick to have up your sleeve. What we've published on recently is multiple cranial nerve blocks. So the concept over here is that if a nerve block just off the, over the occipital nerve is ineffective, how about doing nerve blocks to block the other nerves, the supraorbital, supratrochlear, and the auricular temporal nerves, as well as the lesser occipital nerves. So we took 52 patients who had chronic cluster headaches, who had failed to respond to, uh, to a greater occipital nerve block, and our regime was to do a greater occipital nerve block with local anesthetics and dapometron, uh, and for the for all the other nerve blocks to use a combination of lidocaine and bupivacaine. And what we managed to show in this open label study is that at two weeks, there was a 69% response rate with more than a 50% reduction in the cluster attacks. There was a reduction in the attack frequency of 82% and 50% were pain-free at two weeks. For those who were pain-free, the duration of the response uh, was uh, sustained for as much as 30 days. So uh, while this is not controlled data, it is again, in other hands, a very useful thing to be able to use. Finally, going on to neuromodulation, what are the options we have? The options are entirely dependent on the pain pathways. When you look at the pain pathways, our options are uh, vagal nerve stimulation, the, the vagal nerve feeding into the trigeminal nucleus caudalis. We can do sphenopalatine ganglion. The sphenopalatine ganglion is important, important in the pathophysiology of uh, cluster headaches. The cranial autonomic features are mediated through trigeminal activation leading to parasympathetic activation via the sphenopalatine ganglion, and that's the basis for using it. We can also use occipital nerve stimulation, which also feeds into the trigeminal nucleus caudalis, or we can go directly at the hypothalamic level. So what is the evidence base we have for this? Most of the evidence base is on the non-invasive treatments. So we have the ACT-1 and the ACT-2 studies of vagal nerve stimulation. So what the ACT studies did is they were looking at vagal nerve stimulation as an acute treatment in both episodic and chronic cluster headaches. And while both of the studies were actually negative for the primary endpoint, when there was a post hoc analysis looking at episodic versus chronic, what emerged is that about a third of the patients uh, who have episodic cluster headaches uh, are responders uh, as an acute treatment, uh, and that is replicated in both the studies, whereas chronic cluster headache doesn't tend to respond very well as an acute treatment. So non-invasive vagal nerve stimulation is effective and something that can be used as an acute treatment for episodic cluster headache, but not chronic cluster headache. As a preventive treatment, there are the, there's a PREVA study, which is in fact an open label study. It was a standard of care versus with, with vagal nerve stimulation versus standard of care alone. And what they showed was that uh, suddenly patients who have vagal nerve stimulation do much better. And it turns out that the 50% responder rate with vagal nerve stimulation was in the ballpark region of about 40% compared to about 10% for the placebo group. So as a preventive treatment and chronic cluster headache, vagal nerve stimulation clearly has a role. Though what I think is really needed is a, a randomized controlled trial to really put this on a firm footing for clinicians. So sphenopalatine ganglion stimulation. Uh, I've mentioned the basis of why the sphenopalatine ganglion is important in the pathophysiology of cluster headaches. And on the basis of this, a company called ATI developed a microelectrode which could be placed over the sphenopalatine ganglion. And they then went on to do two studies of which the CH2 study are the results that I'm going to present. Turns out that 71% of the patients found it to be beneficial as either an acute treatment or a preventive treatment. 
46% said they could abort an attack, 49% said they could reduce the number of attacks, and 24% said that they could do both. So overall, 71% of the patients uh, benefited from this treatment. Unfortunately, ATI went bankrupt. Uh, they have been bought out, so watch this space. Hopefully, uh, this device may reach the market, perhaps in a slightly different form in the goodness of time. Occipital nerve stimulation is the other thing that I mentioned. We only have open label evidence. A large group uh, of patients have been reported, 221 of whom 134 are responders. So we have a response rate of 61%. And these tend to be patients who are otherwise intractable to all of the treatments. And given that the disability of disorder, it's understandable why this is being undertaken on an open label basis. The, Dutch groups have, they have done a trial and they are awaiting, keenly awaiting the publication of the results. So watch this space again. And finally, deep brain stimulation. So the target, even though it's called hypothalamic, is in fact slightly posterior to the hypothalamus. It is in fact between the hypothalamus and the red nucleus, and it's more correctly called the ventral tegmental area. And when you look at the open label case series, that is essentially the data we have, there's a 77%, uh, there's a 73% response rate with 42% of the patients being rendered pain-free. So this is obviously a very highly invasive treatment that you would only want to do in patients who have failed everything else and are highly disabled by the disorder. So this, again, is now presenting the summary that I had started off with. Yeah? In summary, in terms of acute treatments, oxygen, uh, uh, subcutaneous somatriptan and nasal triptans are beneficial, as is oxygen, and the agents of choice are really subcut somatriptan and oxygen. For preventive treatment, verapamil has a good evidence base, and that's the place to go to. You can, go to, you can try out all of these other agents, and if you have access to the CGRP1 clonal antibodies, then galcanazumab is a thing to try out, but in episodic cluster headache. For the transitional treatments, both pretroxypinal blocks and corticosteroids are important uh, and useful uh, strategies that can use. Uh, and multiple cranial nerve blocks may have a role, but we don't have randomized control data. For vagal nerve stimulation, effective as an acute treatment in episodic cluster headache and as a preventive treatment in chronic cluster headache. And phenopalatine ganglion stimulation seems to be effective in, uh, both as an acute and a preventive treatment. Good evidence base, but only on an open label basis for both the invasive treatments such as oxypinum stimulation and deep brain stimulation. And on that note, I'll end my lecture and hand over now to Hendrik first. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Mathau, so much. This was a very interesting uh, presentation of the symptomatology and of the, the various treatments uh, that are available today in the uh, cluster headache. Um, uh, I can see that we don't have that many attendees as were signed up. Uh, I have opened the registration again. So if somebody is having problem access and they can register again, I hope that that will solve it for, for, for some of those who have problems uh, uh, attending. And uh, I would also encourage you to uh, ask uh, questions uh, to Dr. Mathau and also Dr. Wallison who's coming on. Uh, right now uh, she there you can uh, ask questions in the q and a uh, section and i'll then address it to uh, to uh, to the lecturers afterwards so uh, now i'd like to uh, leave the microphone to uh, dr louise uh, wollesen uh, she's from the danish headache center in copenhagen where she has uh, conducted uh, some interesting research. She's just about to defend her PhD on the uh, cluster headache human provocation models. And uh, I look very much forward to this talk. So thank you very much for doing this. Thank you, Alec. And now I'll make sure you can show your presentation. Yes. All right, I hope you're all seeing what I'm seeing now, my slideshow. Um, thank you, Henrik, for uh, presenting me. As uh, Henrik said, my name is Louise Wallis, and uh, I'm an MD and a, currently a PhD student at the Danish Headache Center. Um, and my topic for tonight um, is provocation studies and cluster headache, which is what I spent um, most of my PhD time doing at the Danish Headache Center. Um, let's see if this will move. These are my disclosures. Um, so I'm sure some of you listening are familiar with the human experimental migraine model, um, which is based on the fact that migraine attacks are 
A, fully reversible and B, treatable. Um, and this allows us to um, take the patients into the hospital, um, give them something that we think might trigger their attack um, or give them something that we know will probably trigger their, their attack and then investigate um, whatever we want to be uh, looking at at that point. Um, we can do imaging studies, we can look at biomarkers or look at whatever phase of the attack is interesting to us. Um, so when I got into cluster headache and when we were talking about what projects to do, we thought, well, why not do a human experimental cluster headache model since cluster headache attacks too are fully reversible and treatable. Um, and then going back into the literature, you find out that provoking cluster headache has actually been going on for over 60 years now. Um, in the older studies that I've grouped together, um, ranging from the mid 50s to the early 2000s, um, they were mostly using GTN, glycerol trinitrate or histamine, apart from a few largely unsuccessful uh, hypoxia studies. And the studies that were done back then were mainly focused on the patients in the active disease phase. So the episodic cluster headache active phase patients or the chronic cluster headache patients. Um, and what surprised me was that um, a lot of the studies were actually uh, showing 100% induction rates, which is something that I hadn't seen much of in migraine, to say the least. Um, but there was also a very wide induction range. So, for example, for GTN, I've seen studies anywhere between uh, 20 to 100% induction rate, probably because the methods between these studies vary somewhat. Um, for example, the duration of time um, they're observing the patients after trying to trigger them and the administration method too can differ between these studies. Um, I did just want to mention one study that um, I was happy to see that uh, Dr. Matharu also uh, mentioned the study from uh, Dr. May's group back in, uh, published in 1998, uh, where they were triggering uh, chronic cluster headache patients using GTN, and then they did MRI scans on them. And what they um, found there, as uh, was also mentioned earlier, was this CNS dysfunction in the hypothalamus um, in relation to the cluster headache attacks. And I think this is just such a, a good example of the just very crucial and important knowledge you can gain from these provocation studies. Um, so in the more recent studies that I've found, apart from the ones that I did myself, um, there were a few studies looking at uh, the role of the trigeminal autonomic reflex and cluster headache. Um, so the trigeminal autonomic reflex is uh, presumably um, activated during the attacks. It couples um, the trigeminal nerve to the parasympathetic system. Um, so the question is, uh, is this bidirectional? So are the cranial autonomic symptoms in turn feeding back and either enhancing or possibly even uh, driving the pain? And um, what my colleague uh, Sanguo did was um, take advantage of the fact that, um, as was mentioned earlier, some of the chronic cluster headache patients have these SPG electrodes implanted um, for attack abortion, but what they found out was that if you did low frequency stimulation, you could actually activate um, the system instead. And so they wanted to see, well, if you do this, if, if you activate the cranial autonomic symptoms, will you get the pain then? Um, and what they found was that you could activate the cranial autonomic symptoms, but not the attacks, um, at least not to a significant degree. Um, and so going the other way through the reflex, another recent study by uh, Miller and colleagues um, used kinetic oscillation stimulation um, to try to activate um, the afferent end of the, the reflex and see um, by doing this very unpleasant stimulation of the nasal mucosa, will you get um, the autonomic symptoms and will you possibly even be able to induce attacks? And again, what they found was that um, the autonomic symptoms were provocable, but the attacks were not. And so I think what that tells us is that um, it's not enough just to activate this reflex peripherally. Um, what they're doing is targeting it from a peripheral um, target, but you need probably the trigeminal autonomic reflex and some sort of central activation too in order for the attack to happen, um, which is a point that I'll just ask you to keep in mind for uh, the last part of my presentation, which is about the studies that I did during my um, PhD time. Um, the first study was, uh, I think we started doing about five or six years ago now, at the time when the, um, um, the CGRP antagonists were being 
uh, heavily investigated for migraine prevention. And, and what we were thinking was, well, even though migraine and cluster headache attacks are phenotypically quite easy to distinguish from each other, migraine and cluster headache actually share a lot of commonalities that would make it interesting to look at it in cluster headache as well. For example, the fact that attacks of migraine and cluster headache can be provoked by some of the same pharmacological and non-pharmacological agents. Um, the fact that patients of both uh, diseases can have response to tryptans. And um, as you mentioned earlier, that uh, the CGRP levels have been shown to be increased during attacks in both migraine and cluster headache patients. And when you give them attack specific and attack aborting treatment, these levels then normalize. Um, so we conducted this uh, randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study um, of the attack-inducing abilities of CGRP, and we uh, recruited 32 patients, nine episodic active phase patients, nine remission phase patients, and 14 chronic cluster headache patients. Um, and then they were randomly allocated to receive either CGRP or placebo on two days, separated, of course, by at least um, seven days. And then we um, basically gave them the infusion and waited 90 minutes to see what would then happen. Um, and what we found was, I think, this just very, for the episodic patients, easily interpretable picture of uh, CGRP inducing 89% um, of the episodic active phase patients, um, but only 11% of the uh, patients responded to placebo with an attack. Um, and in the chronic group, uh, we had 50% develop attacks on CGRP, um, but none on placebo. And then in the remission group, um, we had no attacks on either CGRP nor placebo. And we, of course, spent some time thinking about um, the chronic patients. What does this um, half induction rate um, represent? And one of the first things we looked at was intake of uh, preventive medications. Um, and that didn't really seem to influence whether or not they would develop an attack, but uh, rather, when we looked at the attack burden that they had reported um, retrospectively in the month leading up to uh, the day that they were provoked, um, and the patients who developed attacks turned out to have had, on average, um, a lot more attacks than the patients who were not provocable with CGRP in the chronic group. Um, as a sub-study of, uh, of this study, we also looked at biomarker levels during CGP CGRP provocation, uh, a study that was um, um, authored by my colleague Agnes Snoir. And uh, we looked at the baseline levels and saw that um, CGRP in episodic remission phase, um, their baseline levels were higher than the uh, chronic cluster headache patients. Um, and for PACAP, it was the episodic active phase patients who were actually uh, had higher baseline levels than the chronic cluster headache patients. And uh, what we just sort of... Um, cautiously suggested was, could this indicate uh, that these uh, peptides um, have alterations with these um, different disease activity phases? Um, during the attacks, we saw no increase of CGRP, uh, PACAP38, or VIB levels, which was um, in contrast to earlier studies that have shown just this. Um, we did sample the patients um, quite early on in their attacks, so it's possible we could have missed a later increase. Uh, related to attacks. Um, so all in all, how do we interpret this CGRP cluster headache provocation study? Um, well, first of all, the attacks were only provocable um, in active disease phase. So only in the episodic active phase patients and the chronic cluster headache patients um, were we able to induce the attacks. And this supports the theory I was talking about earlier that you need more than just a patient um, who has had or is having uh, cluster head headache attacks to provoke them, they need to be in this uh, central on state that we refer to as sort of a central on switch um, that needs to be on for them to be provocable. And we also um, speculate that the attack burden is a reflection of their provocability. So even though the chronic cluster patients don't have this very black and white in and out of um, um, about um, pattern as the episodic patients, well, some of them still have some fluctuations in their disease intensities. And what we were seeing with the ones that were being provoked and their high attack burden levels, we um, speculate uh, reflects a lowered uh, provocational threshold in these patients. 
Um, and finally, we thought it was interesting that the attack rates differed uh, from 89% in the episodic to uh, 50% in the chronic cluster headache patients. And we um, have also since then speculated, could this uh, mean differing roles of CGRP in episodic and cl chronic cluster headache? And, and of course, um, we were, uh, of course, disappointed that the Galcanesa, uh map trial uh, failed in chronic cluster headache, but it's interesting that we were able to provoke um, the episodic cluster headache patients much more than the chronic cl cluster headache patients um, in light of these results. And so the final study that I want to mention tonight is uh, the last study that we did, uh, which has just been accepted for publication, but is actually not, um, I think, online yet. But um, it was a study based um, on a lot of the same um, uh, considerations as we did the CDRP study. So we saw that um, PACUP38 and BIP had been reported to be um, increased during cluster headache attacks. And since both are heavily involved in parasympathetic signaling and the cranial autonomic symptoms are just this hallmark feature of the cluster headache attacks, um, we thought it would be interesting to look at them. And of course, at that time when we, when we started doing this, um, there were both PACOP antibodies and also at that time still a PAC1 receptor antibody um, being investigated for migraine prevention. So we again thought, well, let's have a look and see what happens in cluster headache and see if this would be uh, feasible for the cluster headache patients as well. Um, we did have some methodological considerations of uh, uh, doing this uh, study since um, PACOP38 is a vasodilator that um, induces uh, very visible facial flushing. We thought we would um, exploit the fact that um, BIP gives similar effects, but in migraine does not um, trigger attacks. So we designed our study as uh, not a placebo control study. As such. It, it was still a randomized double blind uh, crossover study. Um, and we did the same with the three groups of patients, but we gave it a sort of an active placebo. Um, and our hypothesis was that um, it would not induce um, attacks. So it would sort of serve as a placebo day. Um, turned out that was wrong. <laughs> um, they induced roughly the same amount of attacks. So um, in the episodic cluster headache active phase group, 43% uh, uh, on PACAP versus 36% um, on BIP and in the chronic group, 47% in both uh, for both um, peptides, and again 0% in the in the remission group. Um, so what we take away from this is again, the patients are only provocable in their active phase. We don't see attacks happening where we would not expect them to be um, in the remission phase patients. Um, and it's interesting that the attack uh, induction rates were similar by PACAP and BIP, but they were actually also lower than we had hypothesized. So even though we are, um, in spite of this problem with the lack of a placebo control, we are um, fairly convinced that what we saw were real provoked attacks, but we must consider both PACAP and BIP weak, weaker provocative agents um, than CGRP at least. Um, and furthermore, we note that um, the attack induction was similar in the episodic and chronic patients, which is also different from what we saw in the CGRP study. Um, so in migraine, the fact that um, PACAP induces attacks and BIP does not had pointed towards the PAC1 receptor as being uh, a possible driver of the attacks. And we can't really say that our uh, findings indicate this. Um, Interestingly, since then, the PAC1 receptor antibody trial in migraine has failed, but we still think blocking PACAP itself is a, a therapeutic um, option worth um, investigating. Uh, so to conclude, um, we find this uh, uh, robust, I think, pattern of episodic remission phases face patients not being provocable. I keep repeating this, but it's just because it interests me what constitutes the switch that shifts the patients from their remission phase and into being susceptible to these triggers that we give them or ultimately um, going about their lives when they go into their um, active phase. Um, I haven't actually shown any data, data on this, but something that I've also noted is that the time to onset of attacks is shorter in cluster headache than in migraine with the same triggers. Um, so it takes a lot shorter time with GTN, CGRP, PACAP for the cluster headache attack to happen than for the migraine attack to happen. 
so we speculate that either we're triggering a cascade of events that's shorter or alternatively the signaling molecules are involved at later steps in this cascade. Um, so all in all, I think provoking cluster headaches is um, absolutely uh, feasible and the attack induction rates are actually often quite high and imaging studies are even feasible as well. I'm so intrigued how they get the patients to lie still in the scanner for long enough to get uh, decent pictures uh, during an attack where the patients can be uh, moving around quite a lot. But this is actually something that I think uh, holds a great potential to really um, dive deeper into um, also the central mechanisms of this disease. So I think the human experimental m model of cluster headache is definitely a unique possibility to put these patients in a controlled setting and study their disorder and hopefully um, eventually point out um, even more and uh, better uh, possible drug targets. Um, I think that concludes my presentation now. I just have to make you host again, Henrik. Yes. Thank you so much, Louise. This was very interesting and it's, uh, amazing studies that you have uh, done on these uh, severely affected uh, cluster headache patients. So I'd like to now go through some of the Q and A's. Uh, uh, we've had some questions from uh, the attendees and um, well, one of the first uh, comments that came up was from Tom uh, Termer or it's a comment. He's from Nova Scotia in, in Canada. He, uh, he mentions uh, psilocybin, so a psychoact psychoactive drug and he mentions that, that it, it could be effective uh, as uh, cluster headache treatment. Uh, as far as I'm aware of, there are some ongoing clinical trials uh, on this. Uh, Dr. Mathau, do you have anything to add to this use of uh, yeah. psychoactive drugs in, in treatment of cluster headache? Yeah, so uh, we can actually step back a little bit, yeah? So psilocybin is in fact, you know, uh, very similar to methysergite. We had access to methysergite. The reason I didn't mention methysergid and psilocybin is that we're simply not able to prescribe things. So this was a lecture about you know, what are we able to prescribe. Now, methysergid, every clinician who ever used it said that it was clearly one of the best drugs that we had around. Yeah, mm -hmm. Given that psilocybin and methysergid are very similar in terms of, uh, of the structure, it's not entirely surprising that, it, uh, that psilocybin is actually beneficial. I think the difficulty is that given its hallucinogenic potential, it's a very difficult drug to use in clinical practice. But nonetheless, I think uh, there, are, there, there are studies going on where people are looking at using these drugs in a safe manner with a safe delivery to see whether it's beneficial. And suddenly, you know, I have patients who have tried it out and who are doing very well on it. My difficulty is I'm simply not able to recommend it as a treatment, partly because it's very difficult to tell from open label studies what is the true efficacy. So these studies that are going on, and there are certainly a few small studies that are going on, I look forward to their results. And there's also a series published of over 50 cases, which all makes it look very promising. So I think there's some potential there. And I think the way forward might be to actually look at non hallucinogenic analogs, yeah? And there are the ball compounds on which there are very small published data uh, that this may be a way forward. So I think it's definitely needs looking into uh, if people are minded to do that. Thank you. Uh, we have another question uh, from Pavel uh, Lau, uh, who asked about what about a TMS in cluster headache as non-invasive uh, neuromodulation? <laughs> yeah, there's no evidence that it works. My own experience having used it in about 15 patients was that none of them were responders. So I gave up at that stage. I have never come across anyone who has published any data of its utility. And I'm not aware of anyone ever having told me, having asked very many people in international meetings whether they are, they are aware of anyone uh, responding to this. So I think its utility in migraine is undoubtedly quite good. In chronic cluster headache or episodic cluster headache, my experience has been largely negative. Mm. And we, ha we have a question from Krishna Murthy. Uh, She's asking about any role of endomethacin in cluster headache and of uh, flunarosine. I would imagine endomethacin is good to differentiate if, if you have a patient with short attacks and if it could be paroxysmal hemicrania. Uh, yeah. Maybe yeah, Dr. Mathau would... Uh... Yeah, so I, th I think this becomes a definitional problem, yeah? That uh, paroxysmal hemicrania is generally a shorter lasting headache and occurs more frequently. And uh, patients who are given... Uh, 
uh, endomethacin and have bruxismus hemicrania, I will respond exquisitely. And by definition, you have to respond exquisitely to endomethacin to have a diagnosis of bruxismus hemicrania. The question that raises itself uh, from time to time is that there's an overlap between cluster headache and bruxismus hemicrania. So those patients who have a phenotype that is more on the cluster headache end who respond to endomethacin, are we going to label that as cluster headache or are we going to label that as uh, paroxysmal hemicrania? From my perspective, uh, to a certain extent, it's an academic question more than anything else. From a pragmatic perspective, the main thing to do is to, when you have got a patient who's got relatively short attacks, short being less than 30 minutes, and the attacks are frequent, uh, occurring five or more times a day, then I would certainly consider a trial of endomethacin. And the main, most patients, if not all the patients who've got chronic cluster headache, I generally do tend to do a trial of endomethacin. Do I have patients who only have a phenotype that is consistent with cluster headache rather than paroxysmal hemicrania who respond to endomethacin? Yes. Uh, do we label that as cluster headache or do we label that as paroxysmal hemicrania? I think the underlying biology is likely to be that of paroxysmal hemicrania, albeit that the phenotype is more of the cluster headache end. And in, in my practice is to label that as paroxysmal hemicrania. Yeah? But I think it's semantics. The main thing is be wary that there's a group of people out there who do respond to endomethacin and treat them appropriately. Mm. Your question in terms of clonorazine, for the calcium channel blockers, yeah, there are open label studies, not only on, well, with Verapamil, we obviously have control data, but there are open label studies on amylodipine, nemodipine, and flunarazine. The numbers are very small, but there are reports all over the place that you know, these can be beneficial. Um, I must admit, I generally do not use them very much because Verapamil tends to be quite an effective agent, but certainly you know, uh, there are, there's open label evidence. The difficulty is, uh, and you know, uh, the number of people who have said this, that if you start looking at cluster headache and everything that is described as being positive, you would think cluster headache is a very easy condition to treat. But the reality is those of us who do this day in, day out realize that actually not very many things work. And that is part of the problem, that you get so many things that are described on an open legal basis as being useful, but in clinical practice, very many of them turn out not to be that useful. And I simply don't know what the role is, and I must admit, I hardly ever use the model being off analysis. And uh, then we, we're going on to uh, imaging. Uh, so it's uh, Ama uh, Apo Kowa uh, who's asking, what is uh, the importance of imaging in the diagnosis uh, of, of tax? Uh, yeah. Um, Henry, if you don't mind, just make me the host and I'll show you some interesting slides. I will. Okay. So... Um, so, so if you're going to do, sorry, let me just, uh, if you're going to do imaging, then the question is, who are the people you should be doing the imaging in, in the context of uh, cluster headache? And to a certain extent, you have to fall back and ask the question, well, uh, what, what are the secondary causes and what is it that we are trying to identify? The problem with, with very many headaches is that the loads of things that are described as being secondary cluster headache, but it's that closed link, that temporal link that is really important. So a few years ago, uh, the Vedic Chirini and I did the study where we pulled out all the cases we could find and we looked at, you know, what are the symptomatic causes of cluster headache? And we identified 37 where there was a closed temporal link and turned out that for cluster headache, eight of them were due to vascular lesions, yeah, of which carotid dissection was reported as being one of them. Uh, there were tumors, predominantly pituitary tumors, and there were then miscellaneous causes. 50% of these patients, patients had a typical cause and 33% had a poor response. And on the basis of this, we found that if somebody presents late, two or three years down the line, the utility of imaging is actually quite limited, but almost all of these patients, given the awful nature of their condition, will ask for a scan. I think it's quite reasonable, given how rare it is, to do a scan. But in the early phase, if someone is presenting in the first part, my own practice is to not only image the head, but also to image the, uh, the, the neck vasculature to look for carotid dissection. The other controversial area is, what about pituitary tumors? So there's a study we published back in 2005, where we looked at patients with pituitary tumors, and we reported that 4% of these patients had cluster headaches, which is much higher than the one in 1,000 that you would expect. And what we found was that functional adenomas were much more likely to call attacks, including sunk and cluster headache. So at that point, we wondered whether all the patients with tax should have 
imaging of the pituitary done. The problem with that though is that we don't know what the prevalence of pituitary tumors in tax is, and one in 10 of the population have an incidental pituitary microadenoma of no consequence. One in 500 have a macroadenoma. So we have just done this study, which is just about to be published. We looked at a large cohort of patients, 718 patients, of whom 267 had routine imaging, and with the rest we were able to get imaging of uh, the pituitary done as well. And what we picked up is, we picked up a total of 17 uh, adenomas in this patient group. But when you look at this number, it is no higher than what you would expect to see in the base population. The base population would be that about 10% of the population would be expected to have a tumor. And the other thing we did is we not only did we do systematic pituitary tumor uh, imaging, but we also looked at the pituitary profiles. And our conclusion in all of this is that despite having done well over 300 scans, we only made a clinical difference in one patient. Yeah? So I think for us to turn around and say that all of these patients need pituitary imaging as well is probably a little bit, uh, uh, is pushing the boat out a bit. And the risk you're running is you're diagnosing a lot of people with pituitary abnormalities, which have got nothing to do with the cluster headaches, but we're making a big deal about it. So my own practice is I offer a scan to every patient. In the early phases, I'll be careful and I'll make sure that also get the carotids looked at. But later on, I really do it, I must admit, more to reassure them and myself that there's nothing going on. I do not routinely go about doing pituitary imaging unless there are some pituitary symptoms uh, that these patients are reporting. Yeah, so that's my own practice. Um, yeah. Over to you. Good, thank you so much. Um, uh, there are also some questions on uh, Facebook uh, uh, live. Mm -hmm. uh, that I'm uh, trying to look at. Uh, there's one uh, who is asking about uh, galcanismab, why it is not effective in, uh, in chronic uh, cluster headache. W what could be the, the, the reason why that is so? Uh... So, Louise, you want to have a go or do you want me to go for it? I think I said my two cents on that. I mean, that's... Uh... From coming from my angle, I've already said what I know about that, I think. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's, it's a very interesting question. Why is it that we have these, uh, these treatments that work in episodic cluster headache, but not in chronic cluster headache, yeah? So vagal nerve stimulation is another example, yeah? That in episodic cluster headache, it works. And in chronic cluster headache, it doesn't work, yeah? And one notion would be that we are looking at different conditions, which is very difficult to believe. I think it's the same, it's the same beast. I think it may simply be that chronic cluster headache is just that much more severe, and the treatments we have are just at the milder end of the spectrum. So they're picking off the cluster, episodic cluster headache, and not the chronic cluster headache. But the other thing that's really interesting in terms of chronic cluster headache is this. When you go and look at the galcanismab study, what you see is they were looking at what the responses were, and what you see is you, you see a U-shaped curve. The patients were clearly getting a response even in the chronic cluster headache group, but that effect was wearing off early. And by the time they were getting to the primary endpoint, the effect had worn off. And I suspect one of the ways to do this study will be to either increase the dose or do more frequent dosing, perhaps doing the dosing two or three weekly. And I suspect that it will turn out to be a useful agent. I think it is probably more to do with trial design and it has probably taught us something. Uh, the issue is going to be, are the, are the pharmaceutical companies actually going to pick up on it and go with it, yeah? Uh, they may not because chronic cluster headache overall is quite rare, but it's actually quite an important disorder given how disabling it is. And I would beseech anyone who's listening that perhaps that's the thing to think about, yeah? Do a trial with perhaps a higher dose with more frequent dosing and see what the outcome is. All right, and uh, we have a question for Louise. It's from uh, Pavel uh, Leahu, who's asking about the washout period in the PACAP 38 and VIP uh, study. Uh, uh, right. Yeah, he's asking if it could be a cumulative effect on, on, of the first drug. Uh, I don't think so. We had at least seven days between the studies, but usually much more. Um, and the half-life of each drug is around five, six, seven minutes. Um, so I think when we were looking at the patients on day two, I mean, we were, uh, I was convinced at least that um, that we were seeing the patient um, all over again, um, not affected by what we had done on day one. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, so let me go through some of the other uh, questions. Uh, it's uh, from Anne Marie uh, Logan in the UK. Have you used uh, vagal nerve stimulation in pregnant uh, patients with uh, cluster headaches? So I think this is a good question because it can be problematic to treat cluster headache patients who are pregnant. Yeah, so interesting. Yes, I think very interesting question. So I have got a huge cohort of patients with cluster headache. I have looked after more than 1,500 patients with cluster headache over the years. Yeah? And one of the things that strikes me is how many patients have I seen with cluster headache in an active bout in pregnancy? And the answer, not very many. Yeah? So I think there's something that's protective about pregnancy and cluster headaches that uh, despite you know, seeing such a large cohort of patients, I've hardly ever had to deal with that issue. Yeah? That's number one. Number two, what are the things that we can use safely? We know greater occipital nerve blocks work very well. Yeah? So on the few occasions that I've had to use uh, a treatment, I've generally gone in with uh, greater occipital nerve blocks. In my hands, in the vast majority, it's worked. In two thousand people, it works. It can be repeated on a fairly regular basis over a period of a pregnancy. And that is, in fact, the limit of what I've been able to do. But I have really thought quite hard about would we use vagal nerve stimulation or not. Of course, the device companies will say no. There are connections uh, of the vagal nerve going to the uterus, and we probably don't know what the outcome is. Now, there's no published data that I'm aware of of the use of uh, the gamma core device in a headache patient uh, who is pregnant. However, if you go back to some of the epilepsy data, where they've got vagal nerve stimulation, there is clearly some data out there. Uh, there are small series, but the series show that the, the outcomes are fine. Yeah? So I would use it, but I would use it very, very cautiously with a lot of consenting. And I would certainly speak to my defense union before I would uh, prescribe it. Yeah? But I think, I think there is some reassurance from the epilepsy literature that this is something that we could probably do if we are pushed into a corner. Mm. Now, there's uh, a question from Mohammed uh, Ibrahim uh, asking about uh, regarding preventive drugs, any differences regarding the type of cluster headache, if acute uh, or chronic, probably means uh, uh, episodic or chronic, and for how long you uh, continue uh, treatment. So we have already talked about the gycanism up uh, yeah. studies, but uh, I guess it could maybe refer to uh, verapamil. So I think that's an issue. If you have somebody with episodic cluster yeah. headache, you treat yeah. them during the episode. And yeah. for, for how long should we continue uh, treating them with verapamil until we taper them off? I think that's a good, that's a good question. Yeah, good question. So, um, so I'll tell you what my own practice tends to be. To a certain extent, very many patients are generally aware of how long their part is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I get them onto a preventive treatment, and if the preventive treatment is effective, I generally say to them to stay on the preventive treatment for the usual duration of the bout and a little bit extra time over and above that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is the vast majority, even when they're pain-free, can tell whether they're still in the bout. Very many of these patients will talk about how they have what they call shadows. They have something in the background. It's not necessarily pain. When at about the appropriate time, you know, when they're due to have an attack, they will either get autonomic symptoms or they'll just get a sensation that something is not right. And they can often tell that they're still in the bout. And I'll often tell them to use that as an indication of uh, as the bout ended. Once that has been completely clear for at least two weeks, I tell them to start reducing the dose very, very slowly. I do it in steps, you know, I'll drop the verapamil dose, for example, in steps of 80 or 120 milligrams once a week. And what I say to them is that if the attacks come back, what you do is just step up one, uh, uh, one notch in terms of the, the dose, stay on that for another two to four weeks and then try stepping down again. And the same principles apply depending on which drug you're using. If I'm using topiramate, then I'll do something similar coming down in steps of 25 to 50 milligrams. If I'm doing verapamil, I'll come down in steps of 300 milligrams. If I'm using melatonin, I'll come down in steps of three milligrams. Yeah? So it's the same principles. But what you do is you look, you listen to the patient and the patient will often tell you. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, and you'll know from the bout, usual bout duration, but they will also tell you whether they're still in the bout or not and they can tell. And use that as a guide. Well, if it's okay, I think we'll take a couple more questions because yeah. there are also questions coming in from uh, Facebook Live. 
We have a question from Ernesto uh, Banca Lai, uh, who's uh, addressing Dr. Mathau. Uh, so it's a difficult question, I think, but an interesting. How to deal with treatment refractory uh, patients? Attacks won't go away with oxygen, tryptan, steroids. What, what to do? Oh, that's my standard patient. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I think basically you have to stick to the paradigms, yeah, that uh, we've, we've outlined, yeah. So uh, I always start make sure that all the uh, acute treatments are optimum, yeah. So you use your oxygen, you use your simitriptan as best as you can. If you don't use your simitriptan subcut, you're going to use the other triptans. I'm afraid that is all the evidence base that we have. You can use intranasal lidocaine. The evidence base is very poor and my own experience is very poor, but I will try that out and see if that is helpful. Yeah, And that is pretty much the limit of what we can do. We published a study of octreotide that can be used as an acute treatment. Very difficult to actually administer in clinical practice because it's so expensive. So I have never successfully managed to get a patient onto octreotide uh, simply because of the cost and the funding issues. Yeah? But those are essentially the only options we have in terms of what we can do as acute treatments. In terms of preventive treatments, I more or less put up the list and I go through all the drugs one by one. Uh, and there are other drugs I can add to the list that you know are used on an open label basis that weren't on the list per se. So Matthew Sergio I mentioned, which we can't access anymore. Yeah, uh, because gabapentin works, I certainly have a group of people who will respond to pregabalin. Yeah, baclofen, there's some open label evidence of baclofen being used. There is a small series published on Capra that can also be tried out. Yeah, uh, so I, I will systematically go through each of these drugs, find them out as best as I can. Yeah, mm -hmm. I will also go through the non invasive and the invasive treatments. Yeah, so uh, I'll in fact jump in with vagal nerve stimulation as soon as I can, when I can. Yeah, and even though the preventive treatment is uh, 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 is effective in at least 40% of the patients who've got chronic cluster headaches here. Yeah? And while I still think that, you know, we do need the randomized controlled uh, data, there's nonetheless sufficient data to do back using this. Um, and certainly in the UK, we have access to it uh, because it has been approved by NHS England. Um, and once I have done all of those, yeah, then I'm pretty much in the territory of jumping in with my invasive treatments. While I'm waiting for the invasive treatments, I will try out my injectable treatments as well. Mm -hmm. I use oxygen, uh, I use steroids, but I generally find that I only get a short-term benefit from them. I don't use them long-term because I think you cause more problems by using steroids in the long-term. I'll give people a break, no more than two or three times a year, but that's all I'll do. In terms of... Uh, the other transitional treatments, we use greater occipital nerve blocks quite effectively in large numbers of people. And we do multiple cranial nerve blocks in a, in a large number of people. Very many of the cluster headaches do very well and buys them some very useful time. Yeah? Things that are not published uh, or we have very poor evidence based on, but I will use from time to time, are uh, Botox injections. There's a small series of patients with Botox injections who get a benefit. And my own experience is, you know, it is somewhere in the region of about 30 to 40% of the patients will get some sort of a benefit in the context of chronic cluster headaches. Yeah? I don't have anything as robust to base that on. And one of the things we use quite a lot of is intravenous dihydrocotomy. It's quite invasive. You have to bring a patient in for a long period of time, for five days. Uh, uh, but it can be quite effective. And in our hands, about 60% of the patients will get a holiday. That holiday can be just as short as a week, or it can be as long as two or three months. On average, we tend to get about two months, and you often have to do it on a repetitive basis. Yeah? So those are the so-called transitional treatments that you can use. And once those are done, I'm pretty much in the realm of invasive neuromodulation. Yeah? And you have the choice of phenopalatine ganglion stimulation, occipital stimulation, deep brain stimulation. And I've covered all of those here. Yeah? And we suddenly have people who have both an occipital nerve stimulator and deep brain stimulation who have got a partial response with either. And with both of them, they've done very well. The things I don't do that have been done some, by some people are lesional things. Yeah? So people will go about uh, transacting the trigeminal nerve. Uh, the reason I don't do it is that uh, I have certainly looked after patients who've had it done and have had developed anesthesia dolorosa, and then they have cluster headaches and on anesthesia dolorosa. One of them is bad enough. Having both of them together is a nightmare and a disaster, both for the patient and for us. Mm. Okay? So that's, that's my paradigm. All right. So there are lots of uh, clinical questions, but I, I would like to ask a question to you, uh, Luis, because I think it's uh, fascinating to do provocation studies on... Agreed. 
cluster headache patients. And uh, so uh, I have not done it myself, but could, could you tell us, I mean, how did the cluster headache patients react to being involved in a study where you could actually induce an attack? And I think it was good to, to, to see that uh, patients outside of, of cluster periods seem to be resistant right. to, but, but I wondered, weren't they afraid that by participating in one study, they would set off a, a, bow, a, a, a new cluster period? Definitely. Some of them were, I, there were some, I mean, for periods, I thought it was easier to convince the remission phase patients to do it. Maybe they were less stressed, but there were definitely some of them too that were worried about that. And some of the patients who were in active phase were also worried about it, making it worse. Um, I think it was easier for me the first time around because I just gave the information. So I was so neutral about it. But the second time around, I really had an expectation that we wouldn't induce any worsening of their symptoms based on what we had seen in the first study. But it would be wrong to give them any sort of expectation beforehand on what would happen and what wouldn't happen. So I was really having to choose my words carefully to not uh, create any expectations for them because you so want them to participate because there are just so few of them. I mean, I think doing this, we've provoked about 1% of the total population of cluster headache patients in Denmark. So it's, I mean, it's not an endless ocean of fish we're swimming in here. No, no. All right, I think we'll uh, end this with two more questions. We'll have one uh, from Facebook. It's from um, uh, Vinay Kumar Agarwal. Uh, how effective are risotripsin rapidly dissolving oral strips for avoiding acute attacks of, of cluster uh, attacks? Yeah, Dr. Martha, do you have a... And I mean, I, th I don't think the oral triptans work very well. Yeah, that's no. generally my experience. Uh, for oral somatriptan, there's actually a published study that shows it doesn't work. And I think it's just the pharmacokinetics here. Yeah? It simply doesn't get in quickly enough at high enough mm -hmm. it is. I think the reason that you have oxygen working and you've got subcut somatriptan working is they get in very quickly. Yeah, mm. and and I think that's what the main issue is. Yeah, uh, I hardly ever use them. Do I get patients who come along and from time to time say they they find them useful? Yes, but it's rare. The, my own experience is the vast majority of the people who come to me say they've been given a triptan, usually an oral triptan. It hasn't worked. Yeah, mm. and I have to then uh, persuade the general practitioner to prescribe one of the injectable treatments or the nasal treptans. And I think that's what our starting point should be. Our starting point should not be using something suboptimal when we've got evidence based for effective treatments. Mm. Okay, so one last question that is from Masiu and, and Nathan uh, Sousa. Uh, it's uh, about um, considering the efficacy of sumatriptan and galcanismab in cluster headache treatment, should we expect the use of lasmiditan and maybe the G-pans for Cluster acute uh, treatment, is there any proper data? I'm dying to studies? find out. Excellent yes. question. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm yeah. absolutely dying to find out. And yeah. yes, I hope they do turn out to be useful. We yeah. desperately need some treatments. I think there are all sorts of reasons to think that they'll be effective. Yeah. And uh, I think what will happen is when they become available for migraine, without a doubt, some of my cluster patients are going to have access to those. And very interesting to see what happens. And uh, on the basis of that, no doubt, you know, if there is an effect, then uh, we would be very keen to persuade pharma to do some studies on those. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much to Dr. Manjit Manthar and Dr. Louise Wollison for participating in this. It was a pleasure to hear your uh, knowledge uh, and experience uh, on this, in this uh, very interesting field uh, with these patients who desperately need treatment and we, where we desperately also need some, some research. And uh, uh, I'd also like to thank the attendees. And uh, I'm so sorry that there seem to be some technical uh, uh, problems with uh, uh, entering this uh, webinar. We'll fix this uh, when we have the next webinar and we will have a a webinar in the future. This is something that we will announce on the IGS Facebook page, but we'll all, and other social media platform, and we'll also uh, um, advertise for it on the new IGS uh, website, uh, which has just been launched today. And I encourage you to go in and see some of the new uh, things that we have uh, in there. So I'd like to 
thank everybody for your uh, attention and uh, have a good evening, a good night, and uh, have a good day. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you very much, Hendrik, for your know, excellent organization. And yes, it's a pity that we couldn't get some of the attendees, but overall, you've done an excellent job. And uh, I look forward to more of these webinars. And I would once again enjoy all of it, all of our delegates. Go to that website. It's an excellent website. Yeah. Uh, have a good evening, everyone. Yeah. And and one last comment. I will also say that this, since there were problems, and uh, we will have the recording of this webinar, we'll have it on on, um, on the ITS website. So it will be available for those who, who missed it. So have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.